All right, now that we're about a minute in, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to Sharing Hope, conversations about mental health with and for uh, people of color. So this is being put on by NAMI. Well, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Nimari Beilu. I am a volunteer with NAMI. I um, do general presentations throughout the community uh, for different organizations that just want to learn more about resources that are available to them or, um, or if they have general questions and just want someone to sort of break the ground and open up that dialogue and that conversation about mental health. Uh, I go and give presentations and help with that as well. Um, NAMI is the National Alliance for Mental Illness. Uh, it's the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization. They provide advocacy, education, support, and public awareness. So everybody has mental health. However, one in five individual has a mental illness of some kind. Uh, and that's because any part of the body, including the brain, can get sick. A lot of times we don't think about this when we think mental health, we think feelings and things like that, but it's all through your brain and your brain can get sick and that's what mental illness is versus mental health, which everybody has. Um, it can occur at any age, but 50% of it, 50% uh, of people who will be affected by it, it begins by the age of 15, 14 by the age of 14. Um, let's see here. Depression is the most common mental health issue and affects more than 17 million people each year. Adult African-Americans are 20% more likely to report serious psychological distress than adults of other races. However, they're less likely to seek treatment and more likely to end treatment prematurely. That's part of why we think it's so important to have this conversation for our community. A suicide is the third leading cause of death amongst African-Americans ages 15 to 24. African-American men are four times more likely to die by suicide than African-American women. A lack of information Oh, here's some, okay. A lack of information and common misconceptions about mental health create a stigma which prevent many members of our community from getting help. Cultural biases against mental health professionals also tend to prevent African Americans from accessing care. Um, this is due to prior historical experiences and lack of mental health professional with cultural understanding. As of 2009, only 2% 2 of psychiatrists 2% of psychologists and 4% of social workers in the US were African American. So today we're gonna to have an open and honest discussion about mental health and mental illness. And with us, we're going to have a faith leader and a mental health specialist. Originally, this was going to be a panel uh, with four, with two other individuals as well, um, but we've broken it down to two smaller sessions since we have to do it virtually. But I'm so excited to introduce, uh, we have Chaplain Pam Adams and Chantel Britcher Coleman with us today. I'm gonna let them both introduce themselves. So Pam, if you'd like to introduce yourself first. Hello everyone, my name is Chaplain Pamela Adams. Um, I currently serve as the University Chaplain and Director of Spiritual Life at Delaware State University. Um, I've had experience working in hospitals prior to being at the institution. Um, I worked at the Johns Hopkins Hospital as a chaplain and family advocate, as well as the Durham VA Medical Center as a chaplain. Nice, thank you so much. And Chantel? Hi, so um, good evening everyone. My name is Chantel Bratcher Coleman. I am the CEO of Shaping Minds Therapeutic Services. And uh, I am also an adjunct professor at Springfield College teaching um, in the Masters of Mental Health Counseling Department. And um, I, I'm just here to join the conversation and answer any questions. Perfect. Well, thank you both so much for joining us tonight um, and for your time. So to begin, I'm going to start with Chantel. So you're a therapist, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. What is the difference between a clinical social worker, a therapist, a psychologist, and a psychiatrist? 
Um, well, okay, so the reality is when you have a license, so we'll, we'll talk about licensed because um, you can have social workers and you can have counselors, you can have therapists, but they're not necessarily licensed. Um, so um, as licensed uh, counselors and social workers, we can basically do similar jobs. Um, it, it really comes down to the billing aspect when it comes to licensed social workers and licensed um, uh, mental health counselors. Um, because we can only bill certain things. Like as a mental health counselor, I can't bill Medicare. But outside of that, we pretty much kind of fluctuate in between um, positions and we all kind of do the same kind of work. Um, when you think about a social worker, you think more of like going to social services and getting those kinds of benefits um, with uh, Medicaid and things like that. But the reality is social workers do therapy just as well as uh, you might have a mental health counselor that does the social work pieces. Um, a psychologist has a doctorate. So with uh, a psychologist, they usually do more testing. They also do therapy, but they do testing. So when you're looking to get certain testing done that is related to the mental health field, that would be your psychologist. And they do not give medication. But a psychiatrist is the person that is considered your prescriber. So a uh, psychiatrist and a um, psychiatric nurse practitioner will be the person that would do your medications and assist us therapists in being able to help a client. Okay, and I know from my experience, because um, I see a therapist and a psychiatrist, often the therapist is who you would see more regularly and the psychiatrist visits are more spread out, correct? Right? Yes, like most people usually see their, their prescriber, psychiatrist or nurse practitioner. Um, sometimes it might be once a month, but usually it might be one to three months that you see um, your prescriber. And your therapist, you can see them weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, uh, depends on how severe your, your mental health needs are. Thank you so much. Um, and so Pam, in your experience, because uh, I read off some statistics earlier, you know, about how mental health affects particularly our community. Do you see members of our community using religion as a reason for not seeking mental health? Um, why do you think that might still happen and, and what could we do about it? Yes, <laughs> to answer your question, um, I feel one of the reasons, of course, is um, the religious or spiritual practices that they currently are doing. Um, if you think about it, they focus more on um, allowing God to, to handle things as well as they're praying and um, they're praying with their pastor, they're praying with the elders of the church. And so a lot of times because they're doing that particular um, equation, they feel as though that is enough. Um, and sometimes it's not. I'm not saying that prayer is not the answer. What I'm saying is, can we have prayer plus the professionals that are educated to assist us in understanding a little bit more about ourselves? Um, can you repeat the second part of your question for me, please? Oh, um, I was just asking why you think might still this still happens and what can we do um, to, to sort of improve that? Because there are so many people that, I mean, we talk about with mental health, but even in real time with the coronavirus, I just saw someone recently say, I'm going to church because God's protecting me. You know, mm -hmm. so, I mean, what can we do to let them know that you, you can have that faith, you can have um, God's protection, and you can also seek a therapist or a counselor as a tool provided for you to help. I think having conversations such as this and just changing the dialogue for, for so long, it's if you have had mental health issues, it's been more along the lines of you're just hiding it. You're not sharing it with anyone. Um, you don't want anybody to know because if anyone finds out, it's basically showing that you don't have faith in God. And so if you do go see the therapist, if you do go see the counselor, where's your faith? Um, to be perfectly honest, if, you, if we look at our culture, we're just now really going to the doctor. Um, we're just now really going to the dentist. So to then say, now we want you to go see a therapist is like, whoa, 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 pump your brakes. Wait a minute now. <laughs> I, I'm going to do everything else. I'm going to get the metformin that I need for twice a day. I'm going to take that high blood pressure medication that I need to take twice a day. I might even take my insulin. But now you want me to go talk to somebody about what I'm thinking? No, God got me. And I think we have to change the dialogue. Um, and then individuals that are not having mental health issues, 
need to support the individuals that are. If someone says that they are going to see a therapist, your face should not frown up. You should encourage them. Well, sweetie, I'm so glad that that's the decision that you have made because I want you to make it. I want you to succeed and be able to encourage our brother and sister. We talk about that all the time. I want to encourage my brother and sister, but if they're having an issue or concern that they need help with, I always say, I'm all for you going to that altar on Sunday morning. Please cupcake go if you need to go. But on Tuesday, make an appointment and see your therapist. It is okay to do so. And so I, I believe changing the dialogue, it has to, we have to change the dialogue. I absolutely agree. And I think that um, at the helm of that is our faith leaders often. So historically, members of our community have been raised to bring their issues to church leaders. You know, you, you take it to God and you take it to your leader. Do you think it should be mandatory for faith leaders to at least have basic mental health training, like a mental health first aid? I would say... Uh Mandatory is a harsh word, a recommendation, <laughs> absolutely, because um, I have the mental health first aid training, and it's it was something that I did while I was at Johns Hopkins, and it helped dramatically in my patient care for my patients, and I could only imagine as um, a, a shepherd that actually has a church how much more in my one-on-ones, how much the more that would help me in being able to have um, conversations with that individual to say, um, I want you to continue to do what you're doing, but can we add something else to this recipe? Because uh, um, if you think about it, the scripture tells us when you're sick, call for the elders of the church. I get it. Please do. But make the appointment. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, go yeah. see someone. Because um, uh, a lot of religious leaders do not have that training, right? Yes. And so we want to make sure that we are getting them what they need. We, I, I say it all the time when our cars are acting up, we take them to Jiffy Lube or to the car dealership where we bought it because it's sick and needs to get fixed. But in this instance, we kind of shy away from getting that same support and that same help. And I'm, my, my message is always get the help that you need and encourage individuals to get the help that they need. So I do, I do say that it should be a recommendation. And think about the congregations you have churches that have big and small congregations and you have individuals in those churches that are licensed therapists yeah. that are the workers and so they do it every single day why not have that as a exactly. ministry with, you know lay health advisors there's so many different terms that um churches are using bring those individuals together but then the, the other side of this conversation is the confidentiality piece we got to stop yeah. talking everybody right. don't have to everything right yeah. and so if an individual comes to you and they're they have um issues it's not your business to tell nobody else keep it to yourself that's the that's uh, to me that's the other side or another reason why people are leery to get the help that they need especially in the church because yeah. nobody you don't want to tell nobody um that i need help because then it's going to be all over the church and people are going to be looking at me funny and the church should be the one place that you feel the safest in. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I'm a huge advocate for that, especially as someone who grew up in the church and had um, some experiences early in life that could have been handled, I feel better, had my faith leaders been, if they had at least a basic level of training on how to deal with that. So I absolutely agree. Um, now, Chantel, people often don't want to go to a provider because they feel they won't understand our culture. You know, as I was giving the statistics earlier, it was, what, 2% and um, only 4% are therapists. Uh, what questions should someone ask their mental health profession, their mental health professional on the first visit to see if they'd be a good fit? A good fit? Well, I, 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 honestly, the conversation begins before they get to their provider. Um, when you are looking for a therapist, when um, you're looking at the back of your insurance card and you call into the number to get linked to a therapist, if you know that you're someone that prefers a certain type of therapist, um, if you prefer a woman, if you prefer African-American, if you prefer bilingual, um, so many different things that you might feel comfortable with, you need to let the person that is... Um, coordinating your services for you, let you, you know, let you know who is going to fit that criteria so that you're not wasting your time going to a therapist that is you're not going to be comfortable with, you know, even even if the conversation goes well. You know, if I come in and I say that I want a female therapist and you send me to a male therapist, 
I'm automatically kind of like on guard and not wanting to even continue the conversation. So I, I think um, we have to be honest with ourselves. And I think a lot of times with therapy, people think that they can't ask for what they need in order to get the help they need. It's okay to, to say that I want someone that's in a certain age range. It's okay to say that you want someone that has um, so many years plus experience. Um, you have to really ask for that because when you're going to talk to someone about their deepest, darkest secrets, thoughts, feelings, um, you want to make sure that you're comfortable. Um, so when you get into the uh, intake appointment, so you, you've done all of that up front. Um, when you get to the intake appointment, um, any misconceptions, any questions, any thoughts, um, anything you've seen on TV that you're not sure about therapy, that is the time to ask those questions. Uh, when I have someone come in for intake, the first thing I ask them is, are you familiar with therapy or do you kind of need to know how this goes? So that way I kind of know where they are on the spectrum. Some people are like, yeah, I've done this for years and you're like my fifth therapist. And then other people are like, no, I only know what I've seen on TV or heard from friends. So you, you just want to have that general conversation in the beginning about what it is that you want from therapy, what you um, what idea you have of therapy. And what I do with my clients, and, and I encourage every provider to do, is I let my clients know that if we, during this first conversation, uh, if I don't seem like a good fit for them, I let them know that I will let I will help them find someone that's a better fit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that we, you know, we, we're all professionals, we all need to make money and that's great, but I feel like I do someone a disservice if I'm keeping them as a client to make money and they're not comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. it, it makes me feel like a failure because they're not getting the help they need. And then it makes them feel like therapy doesn't work. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I've had clients that come one time and, and they have a different preference. And I think as providers, we have to get past our own emotions and not take it personal and just really, you know, work with clients to get what exactly they need. And um, I think once that happens and, and you initiate this conversation in the first um, meeting, you know, before you even get to what the issue is, I think that that sets a pretty good ground for people to, to at least feel comfortable starting to tell you their stuff. Yeah, I agree. And I think that, you know, what you mentioned about laying the groundwork is important because I think more people need to know that they can change their therapist if yeah. it's something that doesn't work for them. I think a lot of times people have that first meeting, they're like, oh, this isn't going to work. And they don't come back. You don't come back. Like, oh, right. I can change my person. And sometimes what you think might be a good fit isn't a good fit. I know right. for me, like one of my first times I went, I was like, oh, well, I've always had a great relationship with like my aunts and people older. Like I want to talk to like a nurturing person. Mm -hmm. And then I got in there and I was like, you know, uh -huh. I don't want to tell you all my business. <laughs> I need somebody right. who's like close right. to my age. So I'm talking to a girlfriend. So, right. you know, yep. And yeah. you may not realize that until you start to have those conversations and it's okay. I think people need to know that it's okay if it takes you a couple people to change until you find the right fit. Because like you said, if you're not comfortable, you're not going to reveal what you need to reveal. And then you're not going to be able to, to heal anything. Then you're just wasting time and money. Right. Exactly. And then you're frustrated and you feel, you know, and you know, about like the, the time and money is one thing, but if, if you are ready and you were genuinely ready to get help and it's like, oh my God, I'm excited, I'm going, and then it doesn't go well, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, it, it just sets you back like 10 steps. And it's so unfortunate because so many people experience that and then don't get the help that they could, they could you know, they, they need, so yeah. Yeah, I absolutely um, Why do you think that people have such a hard time coming to terms with needing medication for mental illness? Um, and do you think this is also why substance abuse is so high amongst those who have mental illnesses? Uh, so, okay, so that's twofold. So let, let me answer the first part first. So uh, I think part of the reason why people um, are kind of skeptical about medication is because when you think about medication, it's like, I don't hear voices or I'm not crazy or you know, um, I'm not that bad off. So a lot of times with people, I have to explain to them, like, listen, talk therapy works for some people. Medication works for some people. The combination of the two is usually very successful for a lot of people. So what I, what I try to explain to them is we can begin the first two or three sessions just talking. But if I feel like, you know, we're, we're talking and you can't even concentrate because you're so 
anxious or you can't sleep at night because you're so depressed, then let's just consider it and have a conversation with a prescriber. And I think a lot of people don't realize that you, it's okay to just have a conversation and not do anything. So um, the way that I have my uh, private practice set up is that my, uh, my prescriber is across the parking lot. So if I get someone that's kind of on edge and like, I'm not sure how I feel about uh, medication, I will then walk them to her and we can have just a general conversation with her so that they can ask the uh, same kind of thing as when you're finding a therapist, just ask all the questions you may have. Mm -hmm. And then I think a lot of people think, well, if I start medication, I'll be on it forever. And that's not the case. You know, sometimes some people are on medication for a lifetime. Some people are going through a crisis in that moment. And some people might need, you know, maybe six months to a year to just stabilize um, so that they can then use the tools that we give them. You know, sometimes if you're not stable enough, you can't even use the tools that we give you as therapists because you, you just can't think straight. And then I also allow my, my, my clients to know that I have taken medication before, um, that, it, you know, it, there was a time that I was so stressed out, I was so depressed, I was so anxious that I went to my physician and, and did get something as needed and needed that for anywhere from three to six months. So, so you know, when, when we tell them certain things about us, it's like, okay, wait a minute, you have issues. And I'm like, most of us do, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's how we can relate because we, I mean, the reality is we're human. We go through things. So um, there's just a conversation that you, you know, you have with people just so that they feel comfortable. And um, a, a lot of people will shy away from medication. Um, I have some clients that will say, I'll just smoke my weed and I'll be fine. And it's like, you know what, I'm going to continue to talk to you. And if you change your mind, <laughs> right. like, let's discuss it. Um, but as far as the substance abuse piece, I honestly believe that substance abuse, I don't see as so much related to not wanting to take medication. Usually it's that there is something going on. A mental health issue is going on before the substance is even uh, picked up. Um, there's some kind of trauma. There's some kind of anxiety, depression. Um, insecurity. There's so many things that a person goes through. And I think usually that is what initiates the substance use. And then when the person is a person that cannot just do the use and they, they need it and they, they seek it and they lose things behind it, they spend more money, they can't get to work, then it becomes abuse. So I think that it, it can go both ways, but more, more than often, um, from what I've seen in 15 plus years, it's that something has happened before that substance use has even begun. So a lot of times they're probably like self-medicating yes, to get exactly. out of that, not realizing that it's an underlying. It's like we said, 50% of people start to get symptoms um, by the age of 14. Oh, but a lot of people, I mean, think about that age. That's your teen years. So already you're cranky. And everyone is yeah. moving yeah. to get out yeah. And yeah. that's also the age where you start experimenting with drugs and drinking and stuff. So it's a lot of things coming at people all at once at that, you know, peak age range. So it makes sense that if someone already has those underlying things but doesn't realize it, that it would just be exacerbated as they get as they get right. older. Right. That and exposure. You know, some people are exposed to things way too early in life. And, and that exposure just kind of makes them think that, think that certain things are okay. And it just, it's, it's just a part of their, the community that they, they live in or, you know, the household that they grow up in. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's normalized. Yeah, and I think also with the medication piece, um, it's why I made a point of mentioning earlier, I think a lot of times people with mental health, like forget that it's tied to your brain, that's an organ, because we do talk so much about our feelings and right. how like we feel sad, we feel anxious, we feel all those things. And then there's all this stuff that's constantly coming at us, like toughen up, think happy thoughts, be positive. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you feel like you should have control of your right. feelings. Like I shouldn't need medication to right. feel better. I should be able to think positive. And they're not talking about the side of it where there's literally parts of your brains that are not flaring off the way they should. So you can think as positively as you want as you every want day. Yep. It's right. not going to help because right. you actually need medication for your actual organ. Chemical, that is the brain. Balance. Exactly. Yeah. And I think people just don't talk about that. I know I personally tried to stay off medication for so long because I'm like, I got this. I should have this. And even if I did go on it for a minute, 
the minute I started to feel better, I'm like, okay, I'm good. Like, take oh, me yeah. off. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it took me a while to just be like, listen, your brain just isn't shooting off the things. Um, just like how I need an inhaler for my asthma. It's the same exactly. with your brain. Absolutely. I think that people don't correlate the two a lot. They just think feelings. They don't think organ, like actual thing that's trying to work. Right. Right. You're right. But that's an important conversation that needs to be um, had and talked about more as well. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about mental health, I know, Pam, we, um, mental health is very uh, multifaceted. So, you know, we talked about the medication and we talked about the therapist. Now, religion can play a key role in that treatment. Mm -hmm. How can people partner their faith with science to help them heal in a way um, without the guilt that they would feel? You know, we talked a little bit about like, oh, I should feel like I can just pray and everything will be okay. And I th think sometimes that leaves people with a sense of guilt when they want to get therapy. But how can they, how can the two be partnered together? I believe if they have a relationship with their higher power, be able to have conversations in reference to praying to God or, or praying to um, your higher power, as I said, to begin to release that guilt and that shame. I think a lot of times we cling to our faith, but sometimes we don't, sometimes we put God in a box. And so instead of putting God in a box, allow God to be God. And so if you feel that fear, that shame, that guilt, then that, that anxiety, being able to turn that over to him, and then at the same time, getting the support you need to understand how do I release that guilt, that shame that I'm holding on to, even though I said I've turned it over to God. Because we're quick to say I laid it at the altar and uh, I'm not worried about it anymore. But three days later, I'm still anxious. I'm still feeling guilty. I'm still feeling all this shame. So I think it's work has to be done. We can't just continue. Remember we used to say, don't talk about it, be about it. That's yeah. exactly what you have to do. You have to be about um, helping yourself. And I think um, realizing that it's okay to get the help that you need. Um, I think it's okay to begin to have conversations with yourself, to encourage yourself while you're getting the help that you need. Um, I think a lot of times we create these narratives in our head and we'll talk ourselves out of getting the help that we need yeah. because we're like, the scripture says, trust in the Lord. So that's what I'm going to do. And right. look, I need for you to get the additional assistance that you need. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we have to get out our own way, if that makes sense, to, yeah. so that we don't feel that guilt and that shame. Because a lot of times it's not so much other people that have put it on us. We put a lot of stuff on ourselves mm -hmm. to try to carry that we were never created to carry. So yeah. I think getting the help that we need and understanding that science and and the person that made it, in my opinion, they could work together. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like yeah. it doesn't have to be separate. It yeah. really can be combined. And just think about how much more happier or or more joy you'll have or how you'll be more productive if you get the assist assistance that you need. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, you know, we talk about laying it at his feet, but a uh, quote my mother always raised me on was heaven helps those who help themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think people, you know, sometimes need to keep that in mind. One of my uh, favorite, favorite stories is you've probably heard this one before, but um, there's like a flood. I'm going to take the, I'm going to tell you the abridged, yeah. abridged version. <laughs> there's a flood, and there's a man on a roof and a guy comes by with like a boat and he's like, here, get in the boat. And he's like, no, I don't need your boat. God's got me. God will protect me. Like someone comes by with like a helicopter. He's like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to take you. He's like, I don't need your helicopter. God's got me. I, I'm good. I'm covered. So then he gets to heaven because he drowned. And then he's like, God, I thought you were supposed to have my back. I thought you were supposed to be there for me. He's like, I sent you a boat. I mm. sent you a helicopter. Mm -hmm. I sent you blah, blah, blah. And I think people sometimes forget that. Like, it's not always going to be some, like, grandiose, like, beacon of, like, coming down and healing you. Like, sometimes God having your back and God protecting you is linking you with the therapist. It's letting you see mm -hmm. things like this to open your eyes to other possibilities. It doesn't always have to be just going to church and praying. 
you know, mm-hmm. right. That's why I'm always talking about. We have the tendency to put God in a box and he's so much bigger than that. And he's able to send individuals our way to help us. And because it didn't come in the manner or in the method we thought it should have came in, we ignore it. And that yes. is very much was the blessing that he was trying to give us, but we are not, we're so conditioned to see things certain way instead of allowing God to be who he is. Yep. Right. Yeah. And sometimes it just requires opening your eyes a little bit more. Um, I know that sometimes, though, people want to seek help if they're able to get past the point where they feel, you know, like the guilt or the stigma and they get to the point that they want to seek help. Um, Chantel, what are some other options for those who may not have insurance that covers it? Because a lot of a lack of resource is also a huge reason why people don't get the help they need. So um, what if they don't have the insurance or the funds to pay out of pocket? Um, so, so there's a lot of different ways. So what you can do is um, if you get associated, like if you don't have funds or sometimes we, even in private practice, we have like a sliding scale. I know I, I have some clients that I'm seeing for free uh, right now, but um, you just have to call the, the different places and ask. Usually with an agency, you're more likely to be able to get services without um, having any funds to be able to contribute because they have, um, you know, grants and funding that will support that for people in the community. Um, when you're dealing with private practice, however, you just have to really ask those questions when you're calling to set up your intake appointment. Um, like sometimes I'll have clients um, because I'm cl- close to the University of Delaware. Um, University of Delaware might send out a notice uh, in the community around that area and say, listen, I have a student that can afford $20 or $40. And then depending on if we're able, we'll take on those clients. Um, so you, you really just have to, to ask questions. Um, I think another way, be, because social media is so big and there's so many resources, um, a lot of times you, you're able to find a podcast, um, there's a lot of TED Talk. Oh my gosh, TED Talk on YouTube has a lot of resources, and it's only a temporary fix because if you need help, you really do want to seek someone. But if you find yourself in a situation where it's like, I kind of feel like this is going on, I'm not sure. You can always like search a TED Talk and make sure it has like a significant a number of amount of viewers and that kind of thing. Or like, with the, there's a lot of different therapy podcasts that you could do. Um, we just started one actually last Thursday on CMP radio that's going to speak directly to mental health um, on Thursday nights. Um, and it's going to, and it's live on Facebook. So, you know, there's a lot of therapists that are out here that are willing to help as much as possible. Um, I think it's easier for us to do a group setting when, when finances are, are an issue because we can reach a lot of people at one time, but on an individual basis, you just have to ask. I mean, if you see a therapist, on your, your timeline, just inbox them and just ask questions and maybe they can give you some resources. And then you have places like NAMI, um, you have um, the, the the different helplines. There's pretty much a helpline for everything. So yeah. if you are suicidal, um, a, in addiction, if you're having issues with um, a pregnancy, if you're a runaway, like there are, um, gosh, I, I think I have a list of probably at least 50 different hotlines. So sometimes they might be a resource to find you some free help. And then you can also look on psychology today. Um, it will say on there for each clinician or agency that's listed, it'll have a list of what insurances they take, if they take cash payments, if they do sliding scale. Um, I, I don't know if it how it's worded if they, you know, if you don't have to have an income, but I'm pretty sure that, that it's a, a way to word it on there as well. So you just have to ask questions. Yeah, and I definitely reach out to someone that's building. Yes, um, I was going to say, um, I definitely think that one of the positive things about the quarantine and the shutdown is there's been a lot of apps that have popped up as well to provide those resources and therapists to people, which I think is huge. I'm a huge advocate for therapists because even if you're very introspective, which I am, so it took me a while to go see when I'm like, I got this, like no one can tell me about me better than me. But what you don't realize is that therapists have the tools to help you change and, and, and fix certain things. So like you may know that you have negative, talk, you know, negative speak to yourself and that you need to fix it. But just cause you know, it doesn't mean you have the tools 
to fix it, but a therapist right. will teach you like how to confront the thought and change it. And so um, I, I always encourage everybody if they can to to see it. Cause like you said earlier, it doesn't have to be forever. It doesn't have to be long-term. Oh, no. It could just be while you're going through something or just to do, just to check in, you know? Mm-hmm. Right, yep, exactly. Um, so let me ask you, is there a common myth about treatment that you would like to debunk? Um, hmm. Well, I, I think one of the things, uh, like a lot of my clientele is, um, is, is minority. Um, and I, and, and I, I don't know if that's by happenstance or I, I think I've been very deliberate about when I uh, advertise, I advertise in our community because I know, I, listen, I grew up in a family like the, the, you know, sit still, be quiet, whatever happens in this house stays in this house. Mm-hmm. And, and it's so funny because like a lot of people come from that and that's why there's so many issues that are surfacing now, especially with um, all the different DNA um uh, websites and things like that. There's a lot of secrets that are that are coming out um, with addiction and, and things like that. There's a lot of people that are talking a little bit more, or people are going to social media to kind of voice certain things that family is like, well, wait a minute, we didn't know that that was going on. So I, I think one of the misconceptions is that uh, therapist doesn't work for us. And I started in therapy and became a therapist. Um, and, and I started in therapy just for someone to tell me that I was in the wrong field and I should go into this field. So sometimes it's just like it's not even about just a mental illness. It's about sometimes you just need direction. So I think a lot of times people think that therapy um, won't work for them or, it, you know, it's, it's not going to be helpful. And the reality is it's just like anything else. It's trial and error. So it, it may not work for you. It, it Hopefully it will um, work for you. But even if it gives you resources to kind of get to where you need to go, uh, it's a good place to start. And um, I think, let's see, I think some people too um, in, in, in the black community are, it, they have a preference to come to a black therapist, which I, I do understand um, because some of the issues that we face, it's hard to explain to a person outside of our race and and, and have them get it. Um, especially if, you know, if, if you're African-American versus if you're African or if you're West Indian, you know, it's kind of hard, like, well, even even amongst black people, we have separations, right? Where we don't know if people understand us because, you know, we come from different cultures. But if the only person that's available to you doesn't look like you, and that's something that you need right then and there, like by all means, crisis, please take what you can at that moment and then try to, Find someone that that's more of what you, you know what you want once you get out of that crisis um, because sometimes we're not, we're not available especially for a black male therapist like you know there, there's a few that I know of and I've been in this field for 15 plus years um, mm-hmm. so sometimes what you need might not be available but get that help when you're in a crisis if, if I think a lot of people kind of shy away from um, wanting to go to the hospital. It's, it's like if I if I go to the hospital, or if I say I'm suicidal, or if I tell someone I have suicidal thoughts, that I'm automatically going to get uh, thrown into a, a psych hospital or, yeah. or, or get, yeah. um, you know, or, 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 you know, the cops are going to show up at my door. And that's not always the case. Um, sometimes, like, a lot of people have suicidal thoughts, but they don't have a plan, so it doesn't get that far. So I think people should know that if you're suicidal and you just need to talk, it's okay to just reach out to a helpline or like the text line that is um, showing up on the screen. You can just text with someone just to get you out of that moment so you can think clearly. And and it's, you know, in my, like I tell some of my clients, if they come in and they're suicidal and they do have a plan, it's like, listen, by the time we get done with this conversation, you are going to be going to the hospital one way or another, but let me tell you what that process looks like. Let me tell you how I'm going to follow up with you and be a part of that process for you so that you feel more comfortable. Because if hospitalized is where you need to be, then by all means, you should do that. Um, and, and and I like to tell people exactly what might happen so that they're not getting surprised. I don't want to call DFS on someone and not you know, let them know ahead of time, if I come across this kind of information, this is going to happen. Or if someone is telling me that they're suicidal, I don't want to just call the police and have them come and not tell the person that this is why I'm doing it. So, you know, so, so some of these things do happen. The reality is um, everyone doesn't work the same. 
every agency doesn't necessarily go by the same guidelines. So there are going to be some times that you it might not go the way you expect, but that's just one experience. That's not going to be your your experience for therapy every single time. So, you know, but if you have a bad experience, when you go to the next therapist, explain to them why you're you're leery about therapy, what has happened to you, what has made you uncomfortable um, so that you can start to, that healing process first and then start to work on yourself. Yes, I absolutely agree. Um, let's see. Here. Oh, and I was going to say, so Pamela, we talked a little bit about um I know a concern for some people with on the faith end is that confidentiality that we talked about, but there is something to be said about your 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 congregation, your community, your fellowship. Um, what the, what can the community or the congregation do to, to support someone who may be experiencing mental illness? I think number one, start by changing the culture of that congregation, um, having individuals to come into to the church and talk about mental health. Um, talking about mental wellness um, and being able to have conversations. I think if the, the leadership of the church encourage the conversation, the dynamic can change. So until that actually happens, I think it's going to still be that shy away, I'm good, Jesus got me type uh, dialogue. But if we are able to have our faith leaders begin to um, encourage the congregational members to get the assistance that they need. And it's 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 different when um, Sister Jenkins says, you go get the help, but it's a different conversation if I'm standing behind the pulpit and it comes across to the whole audience. So I think um, having, like I said, our faith leaders have individuals come into the church, do some teaching, do some workshops, being able to utilize scripture, utilize different parables, things of that nature to, again, change the culture and the conversation in the congregation. And I think if we are able to do that, that'll assist with other individuals that are skeptical because it is a very huge stigma, mm -hmm. um, especially within the church in reference to getting the help that you need. Um, when you need it. Uh, and yeah. I'm not saying all congregations are like that. So I'm not going to put that on every congregation, right. but there are, there is a large amount of congregations that just need to do a little bit more work um, in reference to making sure people are getting the help that they need. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, uh, and I'm not just saying this because I volunteer with NAMI, but the sharing hope conversation and presentation is a great one. You know, we're having the conversation now. There's a whole booklet and I would love to see, uh, you know, even from this to have more churches reach out to NAMI. It's at no cost. Right. They work with your schedule. They send a volunteer and they just talk to your group because sometimes, you know, the, the person, um, at the church may not feel comfortable leading that conversation or may not know how to open up the dialogue. So something like the Sharing Hope uh, presentation at NAMI would be a great fit, I feel like, for a lot of churches. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so thank you both for answering my questions. What I would like to do now is open it up to uh, some questions in the comment section. Okay. So just a moment. Okay, from the LCSW right script. First of all, what's the LCSW? So the when I talked about earlier about the licensed social worker and a licensed mental health counselor, um, that's it's just we have letters like we have all kinds of letters. Yeah. Um, um, but um, as far as I know, I, I'll say for the state of Delaware, an LCSW cannot write script um, scripts. I'm not familiar with what states allow that, but um, it's not allowed here in Delaware. So um, I'm, I'm going to say no for the most part, but there might be some exceptions other places that I'm not aware of. Okay. All right. All right. Next. Why do African Americans automatically go to church when they're suffering from mental health? You know what, though? I think um, I'm going to let you answer this, Pamela, but I do to throw in my two cents. I think that part of it is that a lot of times they don't necessarily realize that they're suffering from a mental health crisis. Um, to them, they think they're just going through a trial and tribulation or the devil's at work. You know, they don't realize that it's, 
-hmm. that it's actually something else, you know? Someone who has racing thoughts, like I have anxiety, might just not realize that that's anxiety. They just think, oh, I'm just really worried. The devil's on my shoulder, you know? So I think that that's, that's a large part of it. Um, what do you think, Pamela? I was gonna say basically what you said. <laughs> it, it, it very much, um, we refer to the church as the hospital. And so I need to go to the hospital to get the assistance that I need. Um, we're good for saying the devil is busy. Don't let him get in your mind. An idle mind is the devil's playground. We, we have a lot of cliches and a lot of quotes and slogans that we cling to um, instead of getting the necessary help that we need. And um, again, if the culture is when you're sick, go to the, you call on the elders of the church. And so the elders are at the church. So that's one of the reasons why we go. And so um, I think we don't look at, we don't look at mental health the same way we look at other things. And again, right. as I said earlier, we're just now going to the hospital, be clear. Yeah. Like we were not going to the hospital a while ago. And then I even think about um, different families as you grew up, you always had that uncle or that aunt um, where everybody was just, you know, they crazy, don't say nothing. And just a little off. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> had mental health issues and no one ever took that person or they didn't realize they needed to get additional assistance. But mm -hmm. I think it's because of the culture. And, you know, we don't tell nobody our business. Yeah. Do not say anything outside of this house in reference to what's going on. So mm -hmm. I think we need to um, uh, begin to change the conversation. Right. Yeah, and I think also as you spoke about that, um, I think that a lot of times we get into this mindset of the best way to just say it is like we're used to the struggle, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Like there's something about being black or being African American in this country that struggle is just part of part what of we it. do, mm -hmm. just part of what you get used to it. We shouldn't get used to it, but we no. do get used to it. And because of that, you know, I've even heard um you know, therapist issue or mental health stuff, like, oh, those are white people problems. We have real problems. We have police brutality, blah, blah, blah. Yes, but mental health is not a white people problem. It's a, it's a real problem for us too. And I think that we brush it off a lot of times because we do have a lot of times more serious, complex, like in your face issues, but it's gonna be hard to deal with any of those issues if you're not in the right mental health space. And I think we as a culture, especially as we talk about elders, just brush it off like, well, we don't have time for those issues because we have real problems to deal with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it's important to acknowledge that mental health concerns are real problems yeah. to deal with. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Any more questions? Okay, uh, let's see here. All right, um, I think that was it for our questions. Um, let's see here. And I did want to mention, um, if anyone, I'm sure you've noticed, but there's a helpline number at the bottom of the screen, as well as the NAMI website. And if you're in crisis, there is a number to text as well. Um, I think this has been a really great conversation. Uh, mental illness can seem scary and overwhelming, but the people who face them can and do get well. So if you're watching this and you're dealing with a mental health concern, um, there's a few things that you can do. Speak honestly to the people that you trust. Um, if you're concerned about somebody who might be dealing with something, um, introduce the topic with respect and love. Uh, speak or seek help from mental health professionals. As we mentioned earlier, it's okay to try new people or try a few people to find the right fit for you. You can always contact NAMI. We provide uh, free support, information, education, hope, assistance. Um, so you can contact them if you're just not sure where to start. Um, and you can become your greatest advocate. Uh, African Americans experience disparities in mental health care due to biases and lack of cultural sensitivity, which leads to misdiagnosis and inadequate treatment. So if you take the time to learn as much as possible about what you're, um, what you're dealing with and what you're going through, you can be the greatest advocate for yourself. Right. Don't get a Google PhD. My doctor always warns me against that because I Google everything and then I diagnose myself. So don't go that far, but do take the time to educate yourself um, and it'll just allow you to have those conversations better. 
Um, and I mentioned, you know, NAMI is always available as a resource and are also always available if you would like to volunteer, if you're someone who is in the mental health field, or even if you're just someone like me who's dealt with it their whole life and want to help other people who have been dealing with it, or if you have a family or friend who's dealt with it, we're always looking for volunteers. Um, so I would like to say thank you so much to NAMI for putting this together, especially after our previous one, um, our live ones had to be canceled. So thank you for the virtual. And thank you so much, Pam and Chantel, for sharing your knowledge and your stories. And thank you as well to everybody who joined us on live today. Uh, we really appreciate your, your time and you taking the time to join us. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.